right? Okay. Uh, but of course, now I have a little bit of a problem. There it is. Okay. Um, I hope you can all see it. Um, if you can't, please just uh, let me know. Um, so one of the one of the uh, things that I really look forward from today's conversation is to discuss with you my approach to the history of communication. Sorry, somebody said that. <laughs> um, I'm in my office right now. Uh, um, so, um, uh, so, uh, I believe that by radically historicizing the notion of communication, we can gain insights into the history and nature of, of democracy. Um, so I'll divide my, my talk in three parts, historicizing communication, revolutionizing communication, and finally inventing communication. Uh, but before moving to those topics, I'd like to begin with a story. As historians uh, usually do, I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's kind of like a trope in how we write, you know, articles and stuff. But uh, um, I think it might help us a little bit ground the more abstract conversation that is going to come uh, uh, afterwards. Um, and uh, it's a story that reflects the kinds of questions that people in Chile were asking between 1780 and 1833, and why we can see these questions as uh, constituting a revolution in the realm of politics and communication. So let me talk about flags and opinions. In, in September of 1814, uh, Chile's revolutionary authorities discovered a royalist flag in the room that a petty merchant named Romualdo Antonio Esponda rented in the colony's capital, Santiago. This is not the flag. Um, spoiler alert, the flag will be burned, but uh, it may have looked like this. Uh, Esponda, the son of a Spanish doctor and a local woman, was not rich nor a member of the elites, yet he was relatively privileged. The majority of the colony's population, estimated in around half a million people at this time, were poor women and men of mixed ancestry, followed by a significant minority of natives, and enslaved Africans and African descended people. But despite his status, Sponda was in trouble. Since 1810, Chile was ruled, but what I will call, for lack of better term, uh, of a better term, revolutionary factions. These were groups who pushed for some form of independence or autonomy. Uh, from the Spanish Empire. They were opposed. Here you can see the, the, a map of Chile, which is on the Pacific coast, right? Uh, and so, so uh, they were opposed by those who wished to remain uh, more directly attached to the Spanish government, which I will call royalists. So it's a conventional way of uh, calling these factions, but um, scholars uh, and historians are very critical of these um, terms today, but we can have a conversation later if you want. Uh, Conflict between these groups uh, resulted in the participation of Chile or the uh, involvement of Chile in the Spanish Imperial Civil War, uh, pitting royalists against revolutionaries across the continent. Uh, Chile's remote location in the Pacific coast did not spare it from being part of this war. And so the discovery of the flag came at a very bad moment for Sponda because as this happened, the Spanish, a, a royalist army was marching towards Santiago, the, the capital, which you can see there in the middle, a little bit of Chile. Chile is that, uh, can you see? No, I cannot see my pointer. So, but anyway, I hope you can see Chile to, uh, to left. All right. Um, as you can see, that it doesn't have the shape that it has today, right? It, 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 um, he had frontiers with other Spanish colonies, but also with the Mapuche nation, the Mapuche people, who were the sovereign sort of uh, um, rulers of much of south of the southern cone. Um, to make matters more difficult, authorities seized Sponda's correspondence, a part of which you can see here, and discovered that some of the letters in his possession contained critical expressions towards the government. Um, Esponda was quickly sent to prison and interrogated by a judge. 
uh, when the magistrate pressed him uh, uh, to um, accept, I can ask him, are you a, a royalist enemy of the state? Uh, based on, on both the flag and the content of his correspondence, Esponda said something surprising. He recognized that it was true, and here I'm, I'm citing his own words as recorded by the notary, right? It is true that he is of contrary opinion to the system of the fatherland. That's a quote. But he had not, quote unquote, damaged the state or any private individual with his actions. This was not a prepared statement by a lawyer, Esponda advanced these ideas in the midst of an interrogation by a hostile judge. But the distinction he made between opinions, quote unquote, and actions, quote unquote, while likely improvised, represented a seismic change in how people in Chile understood communication, the public sphere, and politics more generally. It meant two things that may seem evident to us today, but had revolutionary implications at the time. One, that letters, correspondence, like private correspondence, uh, had no effect per se on other people. This was implied in what Sponda said when he said he had not damaged anyone with his opinions. Um, as I will reference later some other cases in which we will see that uh, uh, government officials actually often claimed the opposite. They said, it was enough for them to find a letter containing some critical remarks about the government to frame that as a seditious action. Uh, not, a sedition, not a seditious idea, which we'll go later, but a seditious action. And uh, the second implication of what Sponda said was that the state should allow dissenting opinions, quote unquote, as long as these had no effect on others. So uh, his own dissenting experience framed as an opinion had no public consequences and thus should be tolerated. So Esponda was just one of many merchants, aristocrats, notaries, soldiers, politicians, newspaper authors, military officers, and all kinds of lawyers and legal agents that starting in 1810 brought into question the relationship between communication and power in Chile. Like Esponda, like Esponda uh, they were not really espousing any specific doctrine or like liberal ideas about communication or political toleration. It was rather um, a, a, a revolutionary process produced through small steps, piecemeal, if you want, um, uh, through uh, uh, in a manner that uh, the very actors that were sort of um, enacting this, this revolutionary transformation, how people understood communication in the public sphere, were, were sometimes unaware of what they're doing, of what they were doing. Um, for Sponda and the many women and men who, like him, got entangled in questions about communication and power during this period, um, these were not just theoretical issues. Um, based on uh, both the flag and uh, his correspondence, uh, the uh, the, the magistrate found Esponda guilty of treason. He was publicly paraded on top of a donkey in Santiago's Central Square, the colony's most public space, um, uh, uh, as we will see later. There, he received 200 lashes while naked. He was also forced to burn the royalist flag and to shout, long live the fatherland, uh, three times. As we will see, uh, there's a profound connection between these objects and practices, the flag, the dishonoring public punishment in a central urban space, and Esponda's claim that his opinion was of no public import. Now, flash, how do you say flash forward 14 years? 1828, uh, Chile adopts a new constitution. The legal code declared that authorities could not violate people's houses or their private correspondence and guaranteed the right of every individual to publish his or her opinions. A particularly polemical article read, no one, and I'm quote, quote uh, no one will be persecuted or disturbed because of their private opinions. These were, this may seem self-evident to us, but these were radical developments and rep that represented a new understanding of both politics and the public sphere, as I hope will become evident as I, by the end of the talk. Um, the adoption of 
such principles, I, I contend in the book, uh, was not merely the result of liberal ideas imported from Europe, but of years of intense partisan conflict and um, of um, experimentation in how to uh, use and understand communication. So now let me start with part one, right? And let's see, uh, uh, and I would like to talk about my approach to the history of communication. Um, and I, I would like to argue that uh, it is only by radically historicizing what we understand by communication that we can that we can uh, uh, sort of grasp the radicality of what Esponda was arguing during the trial of that of that very small sort of argument that he was just an opinion that had no sort of had not damaged society, um, and more broadly of the developments taking place during the revolutionary age, and and to do that. I'll go back to a very sort of canonical text, uh, 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 Jürgen Habermas's influential this structural tra transformation of the public sphere. For those of you who might not be familiar with uh, with this text, um, uh, uh, this was originally published in 1962 and and described the the emergence of what he called the bourgeois public sphere in early modern England, France, and Germany. By public sphere, the German philosopher referred to a realm of social activity in which a self-constituted public debated public matters. Chiefly associated with print culture and salon life, this public was expected to critically analyze ideas and information, judging them based exclusively on reason. In this process, the public created something called public opinion, a principle of legitimacy alternative to that of traditional authorities and absolute monarchs. To put it bluntly, what Habermas is kind of arguing is that the world in which we live today, the world of newspapers, the world of media organizations and critical publics engaging with information is a little bit the result of this process. Um, even though we no longer live by its standards, it, it was, um, we, we have failed the 18th and late 17th and 18th century bourgeois, uh, you know, uh, origins of the, of the public sphere. Uh, so this book has become an in, indispensable reference to interpret the uh, unmaking of the old regime in Europe and the broader Atlantic world, including Latin America and Chile. However, since its publication, uh, it has also been thoroughly revised. Um, scholars have reproached many things uh, to this book, and we can have that conversation later. I would like just to point out a particularly important sort of omission in the text, which is that he doesn't, though he mentions this, he doesn't really pay enough attention to the exclusions embedded in the bourgeois public sphere, particularly those pertain pertaining to gender, race, and class. Um, but despite its many limitations, Habermas it makes a really important uh, I think he's making a, 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 a crucial or a, an important um, um, not, not just an argument, it's really the kind of operation that he's doing that I'm interested in. That's what I find crucial. Um, and it's, it relates to his portrayal of what preceded the modern public sphere. So according to the German philosopher, this modern public sphere emerged as a replacement or in replacement of, though also coexisting with, something he calls, as I write there, the uh, representative publicness. This would be the kind of public life predominant in the European Middle Ages and the early centuries of the modern era. Um, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the, how the argument goes is that in this social and political setting, publicity was structured around representation. Lords, uh, lords and church authorities represented their status through visible insignia, dress and rhetoric. Ordinary people, those below the social hierarchy, had no status to represent, according to Habermas, and thus were included in the public realm only as, ex as spectators. This is a really bleak vision of the pre-modern world, one that specialists do not share, as you may imagine. Yet there's something about this narrative that I find, as I said before, crucial to how we think about the long history of the public sphere, and more importantly, about the relationship between communication and politics. The history of communication understood in conventional terms as the 
um, the history of the exchange of messages or information is here intertwined with the history of other alternative forms of human interaction. What precedes the modern bourgeois public sphere of like, quote unquote, let's say men reading newspapers, which is kind of like what, what uh, Habermas is, is, is exploring in this book, is not the world of rumors, or, or oral communication. He's not saying that before this, there was irrational information or fake news, quote unquote, um, but rather just a different kind of public sphere. One organized around nonverbal forms of communication or interaction. To understand the relationship between politics and communication in medieval time, Habermas is, is, is arguing, uh, we need to look at dress. We need to look at ceremonies. We need to see, you know, study the insignia that powerful men wore, you know, in, in, in these events. And while I disagree with many of the arguments that he makes in the book, um, as well as with, with the larger theory of, of communication he later developed, I think he was right on spot on, in suggesting that uh, uh, if we want to understand the history of the public sphere, we need to put it in relation with these other forms of understanding human interaction, that we cannot just assume that communication exists and is something universal and that all humans across all human history has have thought about it in the same manner as we do. And it's not just a matter of, of uh, and, that, and that actually recognizing this difference um, uh, sort of has uh, important consequences in how we understand the history of the evolution of the public sphere. So um, this is what I attempt to do in, in, in my book. Uh, in the Age of Descent, I argue that women and men of different social backgrounds in Chile reimagined their ability to affect each other and in the process revolutionized politics. To uncover this process, a, I adopt a radicalized, a radically historicized notion of communication. So based on the work of, of uh, John Darham Peters and Robert Craig, I propose in, in the book to historicize communication along two axes. Uh, let me see. All right. So this is uh, just some references about my book. I'll come back to this later. But these are the two axes I was um, talking about. One is that communication is always in dispute. Uh, social actors are constantly debating about what communication is and what makes it effective. Historicizing communication then does not mean adopting the vision of communication that people in Chile had, you know, in 1780 or 1833, because they disagreed about it. It's studying those disagreements. We need to be able to incorporate that difference, that uh, constant debate in our own sort of narrative about the evolution of both ideas about communication and communicative practices. This is what happened with Romualdo Antonio Sponda in 1814. You remember the, the merchant? So he claimed that dissenting exchanges, such as the letters that he had, had no public repercussions. The, the judge clearly disagreed, right? Um, but the second uh, sort of um, form of historicization uh, is that communication can mean something really radically different from what we understand today. So, so it is... Um, Accepting that our current or conventional definition of communication is part of a longer history is the result of a longer history of um, ideas about how humans affects, affect each other. And so to trace the history of communication, while I think it's perfectly valid to just say, I'll do the history of how people you know, communicate ideas and information, um, I think that it, uh, uh, it, it can also be very productive to actually understand that in the past, that was not an, an, an autonomous realm of, like social actors did not really think of their interaction, not even when they were reading a book, that, that the only thing that was happening was an exchange of information. So they thought that there were other processes and forces at work. Um, and, um, and it's important to incorporate that into our definition of communication um, to render it historically operative, at least. So now let me tell you, uh, we can, of course, have a conversation about that. That is, uh, I'd love to you know, uh, uh, go into more details uh, about this if you're, if you're interested. Um, 
Now, let me tell you about how people in Chile revolutionized communication and how in the process they revolutionized politics. And I'll try to be very brief, though this is um, a crash course in Chilean history for, for all of you. Um, so my, my research focuses on, on the Atlantic world during a period of, um, of radical change. Um, as you know, between, let's say, 1776 and 1825, in those years, like in between the U.S. declared its independence, the French revolted against the old regime, enslaved Africans and African descendants in Haiti revolted against slavery and proclaimed the first free black republic of the Atlantic world, the Span and the Spanish Empire collapsed, uh, leading to the emergence of a dozen independent republics in the early 19th century. Chile was one of those. Um, So um the the independent so uh the independence of Chile was the result of a long period of crisis. So here what you can see is a is a very sort of um uh, how to say yeah, idealized version of the proclamation of independence in 1818 uh which uh, this this particular painting was produced later in um in the late uh, 19th century, but is it is quite accurate if we leave aside all the the, the idealization, right? And but um, but in terms of material culture uh, and the representation of the spaces, it's it's actually quite um, quite interesting. But um, but this process really uh, uh, was the result of a long history of 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 um, of crisis within uh, uh, the Spanish Empire, um, and. Um, so I don't think it is necessary to go into the details. Um, I, I uh, it is important to notice that while uh, the scholarship for a long time focused focused on independence, on the processes of independence, really these uh, uh, moments of radical transformation were much more um, had other sort of dimensions that might be even way more interesting than just independence. Independence is really not, scholars today are not really that interested in tracing independence or explaining it and, and do not assign much uh, importance to it. But many other things were going on at the same time. So um, as, as the country was uh, uh, involved in all kinds of wars and civil confrontations over control of the state and independence or not, or like the kinds of like, uh, uh, which faction would remain uh, you know, um, as I said, in control of the state. It also experienced social and political turmoil. Um, and this is just a sort of a collage, as they say, of like different uh, representative pictures of like the different uh, 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 processes that I'll mention very briefly now. So slavery was abolished. So were nobility titles and the Inquisition uh, in the 1820s. Um, in the late 1810s and, and 1820s, really, um, male suffrage and, in, uh, and innovation uh, was expanded uh, during the 1820s as well. There was also a period of relative freedom of the press, especially between 1826 and 1829. Um, and so Chile really experienced a, 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 a moment of, of um, profound social and political as I said, turmoil and experimentations. And, and these ended um, with a conservative uh, and authoritarian reaction led by um, merchants turned politicians uh, who managed to take control of the state in 1830. Um, this victorious faction would only leave power in 1861. Um, In my book, I argue that um, as these, uh, or together with all of this social and political experimentation, another perhaps more fundamental political change was taking place, the emergence of a profane and pluralistic political, sorry, public sphere. It is the place of dissent within the public sphere, I um, argue, that represented an absolute and radically revolutionary departure from colonial politics. So it's really not just, it's not just that people could participate more in politics or that, um, or that there were radical ideas being thrown up, you know, being thrown up around, being thrown around. It's, it's really the idea that dissent is an inescapable 
component of public life that was unimaginable just a few decades prior to this process. Um, and this was not just a byproduct of an elite, you know, uh, liberal revolution, you know, uh, 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 organized around ideas imported from Europe, but the, the result of activities of women and men of different political affiliations and social backgrounds, such as Esponda, a man who, uh, although privileged, was not part of the elites and who was also a royalist. Yet he, with his intervention in front of the judge, was also contributing to this process of reimagining uh, what kind of um, of reimagining the possibility, at least, uh, or, or 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 making it possible to imagine the, uh, that uh, people of different opinions could coexist within within the country. This was something new, uh, and it has to do a little bit with how we understand the very concept of opinion, and we can go back to that later. But at the time, what uh, something that we need to be very careful of is that uh, the concept of opinion did not mean, at least for them, the same that it means to us. And uh, this was, it really took me a long time to actually come to terms, like understand this, because people were, you know, using opinion all the time, but they don't mean um, necessarily kind of like a... a an idea or a, a sort of a personal judgment about something, but they just mean sometimes it's a, a political affiliation. So they might say, for example, my opinion is royalist. And why they mean by that is just they simply, they support the royalist faction in power, uh, but they don't mean any specific, they don't have an opinion about, uh, or, or at least they use the same word. That's what I'm trying to say really, is that they use the same concept to discuss inner ideas and political affiliations. So just a little bit of a bracket there. Um, so it's people like Esponda who, and others uh, 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 like him, uh, I, 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 I put here, sorry to go back, but um, there's like a, a Jose Romero, which you can see just, um, it's the man who's sitting in a portrait. This is a portrait from a, around 1850. Um, he was a man born enslaved uh, who ended up participating in all sorts of iconoclastic actions. Or Javier Carrera, who I will be uh, discussing both of them a little bit later. I'll be referencing their actions uh, later. Um, but just to give you a sense of like the kinds of people who are um, uh, participating in this in this revolution. Um, so let me let me talk a little bit about how then they defined public. What was public in, in this period? In the early modern Spanish world, any action was public if its consequences reached beyond the context of a single individual or family unit. As historian uh, Jean-Pierre de Dieu has put it, actions were not public by ess essence. Their publicness was a property that emerged from their social repercussions. Uh, this notion of publicness uh, is associated with uh, a Catholic understanding of the public sphere um, especially Catholic notions of salvation and sin, according to which members of a community share, had a shared responsibility for the salvation of others. From this perspective, the classification of an event or action as public was casuistic and based on contingent and often shifting notions of social impact. In Chile, during this era, there were two main parameters that people used precisely to say, all right, this is public. Uh, uh, to define what is public uh, uh, or distinguish what was public from non-public. They either refer to visible phenomena, something was public because it was visible, or to propagation, something becoming public due to its ability or potential to spread to others. So these were kind of like thresholds of sorts. Um, and because these two were predicated upon the idea of affecting others, so... Um, both visibility and propagation uh, were, uh, um, as, uh, were forces. You know, so when I'll explain how visibility can be a force in, in a moment, uh, they structured fields of uh, social and political action. So I spent most of the book developing this idea. Why should we consider these fields of action? Uh, but let me summarize it to you very briefly. Uh, 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 so... Um, 
visible publicness uh, was a realm of social life that articulated events that took place in a specific kind of space, most particular urban areas, urban areas with many eyewitnesses. For example, uh, Santiago, the capital, a map of, of, of which you can, you can see on the slide indicating some of the city areas that sources indicate where people saw as most public. So some practices both reflected and reinforced the publicness of urban spaces, such as the tapada costume that you can see on the slide. So this is a representation by a European traveler um, that a European traveler made of the costume in Lima, but the costume is, is um, pretty much the same. Um, and women of different backgrounds wore this costume in public to observe others without being observed. Um, they thus self-constituted as an anonymous public in social, special social events. Um, this was just one among many practices where people sort of reinforced kind of like the visual nature of publicity and publicness in urban, um, in urban settings. A third element is science. What was visible was meant to represent and communicate something, in particular social difference. So the portrait that you can see in the slide from uh, 1816 is an illustration of the multiple material sort of uh, multiple really objects that elite men wore to visibly and publicly perform their status from badges to canes and golden shoelaces. And finally, um, the, the realm of visibility, as you can see, was intimately connected with that of material culture. Uh, so uh, there's the materiality of the urban environment, um, but also that of dresses, insignia, and uh, other objects that people will eventually sort of also uh, display in public. This is why Esponda was weaving a royalist flag in 1814. Most likely, he wished to exhibit the flag, a little bit like in the representation that you can see there for a later period, um, in the urban landscape to publicly manifest his support for the royalist army once it reached Santiago. So that's what authorities believe. And it seems pretty clear that that's why he was weaving a flag um, secretly in his um, in, in the room he rented in, in the capital. Now, propagation was a more abstract form of publicness. So I don't have that many illustrations to make this part of the talk a little bit more um, uh, interesting. But so just bear with me. Uh, propagation described the potential of an action or behavior to disseminate across society and affect others. This form of communication operated via, mainly via two mechanisms, imitation and contagion. As a form of communication, propagation designated much more than the simple transmission of information. Men and women of this era used these concepts of imitation and contagion to describe processes of mutual influence and dissemination that did not always involve discursive material. For example, an individual's action or behavior could propagate and impact others, even if the person never spoke, wrote, or even tried to communicate in the way we understand it with others. So uh, just to give you an example, um, one, of the, one of the social actors that were constantly sort of framed as, as um, dangerous because they, uh, uh, they, they had an impact on others were women who failed to conform to patriarchal sexual norms. So they were often framed as both uh, contagious and a bad example. And it's just their behavior. There, it's not that they're saying anything. It's not that they're persuading other people to you know, uh, join their alleged way of life. Many of these accusations seem really based on, on, on nothing, by the way. But in any case, um, and, and so the reaction uh, 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 is, is from, from authorities is really um, telling, is that they set up um, asylums that are called Casa de Recogidas, which are just places where they uh, imprison women, sometimes for without a sentence, some, without a magistrate even um, you know, going through the courts. It's just that they're sent women who are considered to be contagious um, because of their immorality are sent to this, this um, detention houses um, with an uh, indeterminate, for an indeterminate amount of time. So you can imagine the kind of suffering that these women sort of experience because of the way in which they were framed as a sort of a public um, threat. 
but they were not saying anything. They were never accused of having an opinion or an idea. It was a form of censorship that was um, that corresponded to an idea of communication that was nonverbal, right? Um, associated with this notion of propagation came a series of practices. Uh, uh, and among them, like the the, the asylum houses that I, I, I was mentioning, um, as well as um, a specific conceptual vocabulary that we can discuss later if you're interested, such as the words contagion, scandal, um, and others. On the slide, you can see a a, a book, like the, uh, how do you say, the, the cover of a book, um, that discusses, uh, it was published in 1828, and it, it discusses kind of like um, the need for the Chilean youth to uh, imitate the heroes of uh, the independence era. But it's really partisan. It's actually imitate the heroes of the liberal party. Um, and um, it's an example of the power that uh, political actors at the time attributed to imitation. They thought that this was really a way of like not only promoting independence, but also promoting their own political faction. Um, and they really believed that this was uh, very powerful. So um, these forms of communication, these fields really, where people interacted, were supposed to be limited by two official political principles, unity and transcendence. Very briefly, unity just meant that everything that took place in the public realm should favor and reinforce society's uh, ideal form, which was unity in hierarchy, and transcendence meant that no public expression could infringe or could um, impact, let's say, the king's sovereignty, and that vassals needed to uh, manifest due respect in public um, constantly, right? So between 1780 and 1833, people in Chile drew on visibility and propagation to transgress both the principles of unity and transcendence. People like Jose Romero, the man born in slave that I mentioned earlier, who manifested in public his dissenting views and disrespected in 1824, according to some observers, uh, conventional um, social hierarchies as well as public authorities. So for example, uh, uh, the, the specific anecdote is that he participated in a demonstration against the constitution. So first transgression, he, people like him were not supposed to have a, a saying in such a majestic, uh, transcendent uh, source of authority as the constitution. So he manifested against it, um, but also uh, the uh, group that he was in, a group of probably liberals, but many other uh, people of color, uh, destroyed portraits of independence era heroes of the, an opposite political faction. So they laid hands on representations, on signs of sovereignty and power. And uh, moreover, he's, um, according to some uh, traditions, he's supposed to have also found a, a portrait of the king, of the Spanish king, who was no longer in control of Chile, but many in the country remained, you know, had their sympathies still for the king. And, and, and Romero might have um, imagined that in the future, royalists might control the country again. Uh, well, he found one of these and, and mocked, he mocked the king. So a man who was born enslaved ended up in 1824 participating in an event in which he mocked the Spanish king. Um, the same happened with Javiera Carrera, the woman you can see below, who um, in 1812 participated in an iconoclastic demonstration against uh, against royal sovereignty. So she went to a public ball bearing, wearing a, a an insignia on her, on her on her hair of a crown, an inverted crown. So I'll try to wrap up really br very briefly with inventing communication. And I won't go into the details, but um, as people were doing this, they also came up with a, um, uh, with the concept of opinion, as I showed you with in Esponda's case, and they started using opinion to actually uh, frame their own actions as um, having no impact over other people. So you see, what makes visibility and propagation uh, 
different from our understanding of communication is that they always carry, like observing them in action was always observing them doing something to people. Uh, people always claim that anything that was public had an impact on others. So uh, in uh, several um, criminal trials uh, in 1810, 1811, 12, 13, 14, 16, 17, and then 1833, and also eventually in newspaper articles and uh, other publications, people of all walks of life in Chile started arguing that actually um, their dissenting actions should be understood as the public expression of an opinion or a thought. So something that looks like our notion of communication. That's why I put here inventing communication as if they were inventing the, the concept of communication that is that is similar to the one or it seems a bit closer to the one we conventionally sort of use uh, in the present. And this allowed them, this was a way for them, as Esponda was doing in 1814, to um, advocate for the toleration of different political positions. And they reinvented in a certain way, uh, 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 or they proposed a different understanding of the public sphere uh, arguing that um, uh, in a certain that we could express our opinions in public and that that expression had no intrinsic power, so people could express any opinion they wanted. The, some people went out as far as uh, Jose Miguel Infante, a, a, a politician who in 1829 published in his newspaper. Um, so at that time, some newspapers were just just one guy, you know, writing everything. So he had a newspaper and that was his thing. And he just published this over like for many years. And uh, he argued there that uh, there was no crime of sedition, that it didn't exist, and that there were no speech crimes either, that um, never in the history of humanity had a, a sort of critical a piece published in a, news, a newspaper piece, you know, uh, created a revolution or incited a revolution. So the, it was absurd to think that way. And that's kind of like the, the his, he doesn't use those exact words, but that's pretty much what he's arguing. And, and, uh, and you see, that's, that's a radical departure from the world in which that person was born. He's not, you see, it's, it's in this world, really the expression of an opinion, the expression of division, the expression of difference has no uh, immediate effect on others. And um, I'll stop here so that we can have some time for conversations. And thanks, thank you very much for bearing with me for this long. And um, I look forward to hearing your, your thoughts and comments and, um, and uh, thanks again. I may stop sharing because. Oh, great, Martin. Thank you so much. That was fascinating and very multi-layered. So I suspect we'll have a range of different um, questions. Maybe if I can just start um, just by asking like in relationship to like both the case and other ways of approaching like social change or the relationship between communication and politics. Like you, you mentioned a few references, you know, Habermas, people like that, but like, um, like where do you position yourself relative to, you know, some of those sort of larger international transnational debates about the relationship between communication and revolutionary change, like sketched in like the most like unfair way is like, communication causes revolutions and or the reverse. Exactly. Yes, I'll be very unfair. <laughs> but I'll say uh, uh, I, I disagree with the um, scholars, with scholars who assume both what communication is and what it does. And um, so I, in general, I think that any sort of argument that is based on the notion of dissemination will end up being Eurocentric. And um, even, even if, you know, the author might claim that, you know, enslaved people in the Caribbean sort of reinterpreted the Enlightenment in their own manner and so on, it ends up being about the Enlightenment in Europe being sort of exported and creating some, some kind of revolution. And, and I, I just, uh, in my opinion, 
this doesn't mean that communication doesn't play any role. I think that there's a uh, there's a there's a difference between just uh, the assumption that revolutionary ideas create revolutions, and uh, or there's a misunderstanding of, about what we're actually observing. When we observe those ideas being communicated, what we or being you know replicated in different parts of the world, what we're observing is a manifestation of social coordination. So there, I would go with kind of like Habermas. So what we're just seeing is people coordinating action. Is the idea won't generate any anything? It doesn't. I can stand outside here and start shouting against the regime or something, and it's not going to fall, right? But so so I find that a little bit. Um, I'm a little bit against the 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 that uh, kind of scholarship that sometimes seems to be predicated. Of course, nobody's doing that kind of like very silly argument that I made, but. Um, I think we should frame the relationship between communication and power uh, differently. Yeah. Great. Questions? I guess probably the easiest thing is if people use like the hand wave thing and we just go that way. Yeah, Russell, go for it. Yeah, I've got a question. So uh, thank you for the talk. I really uh, appreciated it. Um, at the end, you kind of talked about this, like this essay um, that was about this this notion uh, or like almost a definition of um uh opinion as that which that kind of communication that doesn't have an effect but i'm kind of wondering like the extent to which you think that the person writing that essay and like maybe some of the people that have started to think about this or even or at least like use it as a defense in court were really taking that seriously because like why write the essay right like if they think it doesn't have an effect if they're like offering a view of like political communication that says oh we should have opinions because they don't have an effect like what are the like why write it unless you're trying to convince somebody of a conception of the public sphere right so like do you think that they were i mean how do you reconcile that maybe yes that's an excellent question so more there are yes these essay newspaper articles and and um I think the the best sort of example of what you're saying is that um, in 1810, the first sort of very, very uh, detailed formulation of this idea, which I wanted to discuss with you, but I realized I wrote it too much, um, was written by a man named Bernardo Vera, who was put on trial for seditious ideas against the Spanish government. So 1810. And he says, you know, eventually he says, we, we're allowed to have whatever opinion we want, as long as that doesn't come out and, or if it, if it does come out, but it's in a kind of like a, a personal setting with friends and family, it, it doesn't have a public effect. It's just an opinion and it should be allowed. Four years later, that's the man is the same person who uh, was the magistrate in charge of Esponda's case. So the same person who says, you know, uh, he also says private correspondence should never be read by any authority. Like that's that's outside of state jurisdiction. Well, he's reading Esponda's letters. So uh, I think uh, one of the one of the main sort of um, one of the main characteristics of political life uh, during this era in the Hispanic world in general is that uh, people are trained to be um, casuistic in a certain way in school. So they sometimes historians made the mistake of like trying to figure out what they really think about something when they are always they're always, you know, trying to achieve something. They're 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 always kind of like in a in a debate mindscape. They're always trying to win a debate. They're uh, so um but what I would say what makes the difference is that they through the, all of these interactions they introduce a, a plausible new way of interpreting the way in which they affect each other. So regardless of not whether they actually believed what they were writing, they thought that maybe the 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 people, you know, maybe the judge will would agree with them. And like that that example, there are many others. So for example, there's a legislator who also sort of advocated as a as a lawyer in favor of toleration. And then when he was a when he was a kind of like in charge of drafting a new constitution, he was all like, no, no toleration. Like, you know, private papers, yeah, the government should have some 
you know, um, jurisdiction over them and that kind of argument. Uh, I don't know if I'm making sense. It's kind of late here, so I'm sorry if I'm, um, for those of you who might be unaware of the, uh, um, English is not my first, uh, nor even my second language. So at this time of the day, it starts to, you know, my language skills start, uh, you know, <laughs> um, failing. Thank you. Yeah. Patricia. Martin, thank you so much for your talk, really. Um, I was struck by something you said early on when you said, you know, opinion meant something different. It's not the traditional opinion definition that we talk about usually. And you talked about it as being more affiliation based. And so that obviously speaks to deep ties or deep roots to group identification. Excuse me. <laughs> to group identification. Can you share with us some of the well, two questions. Number one, some of the uh, so socialization processes that will lead one to grow up thinking about identif about opinion this way? And second, to what extent does this definition still hold today? That's a, a great question. Um, so I see this notion of opinion um, as actually a, a, a disruption to the way in which people had been socialized. So um, the during colonial times, there were many factions among the elites. So it's a very factional period. Uh, there are all this, it's very difficult to read these because they're, you know, they're not writing that much about this, but but uh, I mean the elites themselves. Um, but, um, but we know there are all kinds of like factions and they hate each other and they're, but in public, there's no partisan politics. They all go together. They all uh, emphasize harmony and unity. And um, and so there are no political parties. There are no, or uh, yeah, there are no political parties. Yeah, and, and so what I see happening is that as the crisis of the Spanish empire sort of progressed and uh, Chile became engulfed in a revolutionary process, people started using the same concept that they used to refer to their inner thoughts to catalog, to position themselves and position others within a kind of like a mental map of potential sort of uh, affiliations. So sometimes people say, this is my opinion, but uh, your question is great because I, I, it leads me to uh, the following observations that most of the time is other people saying, this is your, this is the opinion of this other person. So for example, a, a judge might initiate a criminal investigation against someone and what they were going to ask uh, others is like, what is the opinion of this person? Where do they stand in matters of opinion? That's another way in which they phrase this. So uh, in a certain ways, uh, um, it's a it's a very sort of complex process that I think it really uh, speaks to the decomposition of the of the um, of uh, colonial politics, if you want, and and the emergence of this more partisan and divided world. And and I don't know. Uh, here's where I'll be completely a historian. I don't know if this is if there's still kind of like the concept of opinion we use uh, today. I think. Um, I think there are some connections, but I, I really, most of the time, since, since I started doing this research, I realized that um, if there's a central concept in our modern world that we do not pay much attention to, and we are unaware of like its theological origins and kind of like all the baggage that it carries is opinion. Is It's like a weird thing. We take it for granted. We see it as natural. And it is such a, such a weird thing sort of concept. And what I'm pretty sure of is that it would have made no sense to somebody in 1780 if I asked him, what is your personal opinion on something, on some political issue, for example, on like, you know, what is the correct, you know, uh, form of social organization? Should we be an equal republic or a, you know, a, should enslavement be continued? They would have said, I, what is to have an opinion about this? And that's my impression. Um, uh, so of course, perhaps I'm exaggerating a little bit. I, I do think that there's it's really there's like a um is one of the concepts that we there's a lot of 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 scholarship on public opinion. 
But here I'm not talking about public opinion. It's just opinion, just what it means to have an opinion, right? And 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 sometimes I'm very perplexed at at this uh, specific yeah concept. I don't know if I'm making much sense, but um, no, you're making complete sense. I understand what you're saying. This idea of community is closely tied to public opinion and without modern media you just have a different sense and you don't have a sense of what public is unless you're at a bonfire or something else yes i think i think there is a complete different kind of like social and material background yeah to what uh to what sort of uh structures their understanding of what is public yeah so I realize we're we're at the hour, and that also means it's it's what what started as a late hour for you, Martin, has now become a very late hour. Um, and so I just want to, like, on behalf of everyone, just say thank you for like a very informative, very thoughtful, and and very fun way to spend um, spend the hour. Um, so thank you very much for for taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it. Um, thanks to all of you. Thank you for your patience and for listening to me.